I take out your Bibles and open them to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. We're going to begin there. and We're going to move around a little bit this morning in the Old Testament as we try to answer what I believe to be a very important question. And that is, why did Jesus have to die? And I was having a conversation with one of our young people a couple of weeks ago when this question came up. And I thought, you know, that's a great question. It's certainly one that we ought to explore and be willing to explore. Why is it that Jesus, the Son of God, went on that cross and gave up his life, suffered everything that he suffered for you and me? And I've heard people talk about that as if it was one way that God could have redeemed mankind. But I think it's very interesting in Luke 24, that is not how Jesus speaks of his crucifixion. Instead, what we find in Luke 24 is that it was necessary for him to die. In other words, Without that, there was no other way for you and I to be saved from our sins. Of course, Luke 24, you know the context as well as I do. Jesus has been raised from the dead, and he's been walking down the road with two disciples on the way to Emmaus who have no idea who he is. And they're having this conversation with him and talking to him about the events that had taken place, the crucifixion, the apparent resurrection of this man named Jesus. And they're very confused about this. They don't seem to understand What's going on? Verse 25, Jesus speaks to them and he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. This morning, we're not going to look at all the prophets or all the scriptures, but I do want to take that same concept or that same format, and let's go back to what we learn in Moses and the prophets and try to understand, if we can, why it is that God's Son, God Himself, had to come to this earth and die on that cruel cross. Why couldn't the Father have done something else in order to save us from our sins. And I really think there's three reasons, or at least three reasons we're going to explore this morning for that fact. Number one, the wages of sin is death. We're going to talk about why that is and how important that is in the crucifixion of Jesus in just a moment. Secondly, what we find, and I think we find this from Genesis to the book of Revelation, is that God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't play favorites. He doesn't treat one person fundamentally different than he treats another person, especially not in regards to salvation. And the last but certainly not least, there was absolutely no other sacrifice that could be sufficient to accomplish what the sacrifice of Jesus Christ accomplished. And I think that's extremely important for us to understand. So I want to go back to the book of Genesis. If we're going to start with the books of Moses, we might as well start with the first one, right? And and let's understand some things about who we are and what we are and how we've been created and what we've been created for. And of course, in Genesis chapter 1, what we find out is that there is a specific purpose for which we were made. And by the time we get to Genesis chapter 3, we find out very clearly that sin violates that purpose. And it does so by destroying our ability to to have fellowship with God. And I would suggest to you that that is why we were created. Genesis chapter 1, and there in verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And from that point on, you find God having a different relationship with mankind than with any other created being. You find God reaching out to mankind and and seeking to be part of his life and calling mankind to be part of, of God's family, God's fellowship, if you will. But then, of course, what we find out is that sin destroys that. And I'm not going to read Genesis chapter 3. You're familiar with the story there of Adam and Eve and eating of the fruit that God had forbidden them to eat of. And of course, the result of that was they were cast out of the garden. In that garden, in chapter 2, what we find, in in chapter 2, we find that they were naked and not ashamed. And you might say, what does that have to do with anything we're talking about right now? 
The idea there is that they were completely vulnerable before God. Everything was open between them and God. There was no covering. There was nothing hiding or nothing to be hidden. Remember the first thing that Adam and Eve do once they eat of the fruit. They go hide, right? They go cover themselves. They were open before God and there was nothing there to be ashamed of. Now, if you go read similar passages, passages where God, where, where man is in the immediate presence of God, they're always afraid or ashamed. Isaiah chapter 6 is the first one that comes to my mind. Woe is me, I am undone, Isaiah says. Not that he was a wicked man, but he, like all men, had done wicked things. And he recognized that as he stood before the ultimate holiness of God. But you know, as you go back over to Genesis chapter 1, and there in verse 27, God created man in his own Image That may be one of the more important statements for us to understand in all of Scripture because it kind of sets the tone for everything else that we're going to read about in, in mankind and our relationship with God. We were made in His image. And, and I think understanding that is, is a little more complicated than, than it might seem from first reading that. We talked about this a little bit, that word image there in, in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, at least in the Hebrew can be translated as either a noun or a verb. And what you'll find is in both Hebrew and Greek, there are certain terms that have that kind of ambiguity. And you can use them in a manner that doesn't eliminate the ambiguity, such as this passage. And the reason you would do that is you want to see both meanings. So we're made, there's something that about us you know, intrinsically that's different than the rest of creation, that, that has something in common with the divine. And I think we would understand that to be our soul or our spirit. But then if we think about that as a verb, what we find is our charge, our work to do in this world. And what is our work to do in this world? Well, we're to be God's image bearer. We're to go forth in this world and we're to demonstrate his rule. Notice verse 26 is all about rule. And we're to demonstrate his righteousness and holiness. How do we know that? Well, that's kind of an interesting term, the way it's used. As a matter of fact, in most other places where you see that Hebrew term translated image used, it's actually describing an idol. Now, what we're talking about when we talk about the idol is not the concept of idolatry, but the actual object that the idolater would bow before. Numbers 33 and verse 52, shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figured stones and all their molten images and demolish all their high places. Destroy their idols is what Moses is telling them, right? What they're being instructed. 2 Kings chapter 11, and there in verse 20, they transformed the beauty of his ornaments into pride, and they made the images of their abominations and their detestable things with it. So it's that idea of the object that you look at that is intended to represent the nature of a God. And when you get to the Ten Commandments, one of the first things Israel was told is not to make any carved images. Why not? Well, we didn't need another carved image to represent God. We are supposed to be God's representatives here on this earth. And, and so God forms this nation. We've mentioned Israel. He forms this nation, and he tells them to be a kingdom of what? Priests. Again, go out in the world and reflect the holiness of God. And sin absolutely destroys that work. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, he who sins is of the devil. The very enemy of God, and maybe in a sense in our minds, the very opposite of God. And, and when we sin, when we're committing sin, when we're guilty of sin, we're representing him, not the God that created us. So sin destroys the purpose for which we have been given, or been, been created, I should say. And then turn over to Leviticus chapter 17, and this is something I've struggled with for a long time, this understanding the necessity of this connection. And maybe, maybe I can help you understand it a little bit this morning. If not, maybe I can intrigue you to do some more research. But turn over to Leviticus chapter 17, because I think this is kind of interesting. There's a principle in the Old Testament that's repeated in the New Testament, and that is this idea of there must be a death on account of sin. And so when you begin to read about the old law and the sacrificial system, that's what you see over and over and over. The pages of your Old Testament are soaked in the blood of bulls and goats who've been sacrificed in order to deal with or atone for the sins that man has committed. 
And so in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, I think we get at least some hint as to why that is. He says there, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your soul. For it is the blood by reason of life that makes atonement. So a couple of things are connected there that are very interesting. First of all, there's this idea of, of death, bloodletting, in order to accomplish atonement. But not only that, we see this connection between blood and life, but he also connects in there the idea of the soul. And so in that burnt offering, in that animal sacrifice, the blood that is shed is representative of the life of man, which is, is embodied in the soul of man. What is it that makes us different from everything else that is obviously created in the image of God? Well, it's that immortal soul that we possess. Which, if I'm to understand Leviticus 17 and there in verse 11, is the life that we have. Without that soul, we have no life, just as the animal without its blood has no life. And so there's a sort of payment being made here, isn't there? There's a life for a life that has been being given. Release from sin demands a life to be given. Why? Because sin has destroyed a life. Because sin has destroyed a life. We'll come back to that idea a little more here in just a moment. But I, I want to move on and talk about God and His relationship with us. It was, it's very important, I, I think, as we begin to understand God's desire for fellowship with us and the way that that fellowship is brought about, is to notice the fairness of God, the justice of God. And really, you know, when we start thinking about our relationship with God, I know we like to talk about love and grace and mercy. But the foundational principle upon which our relationship with God is built is His holiness and His justice in dealing with us. In other words, He deals with you and me the same. He's not interested in how rich or how poor someone is. He could care less what, what race or gender we, we might uh, be a part of, what nationality, what time period. None of this matters. God deals with us in an equitable manner he has the same expectations of us, at least in principle. Someone says, well, he had different rules under the old law than he does the new. You're right. The faith demonstrated through obedience was a part of that old law just as surely as it is ours today. He deals with us in a just manner. He deals with us equitably. Abraham understood this. In Genesis 18, when, when God is going to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and he tells Abraham that that is what he is going to do. Uh, Abraham has this little conversation with God, doesn't he? Well, God, what if I find, what if I find 50 righteous within the city, Genesis 18 and verse 24? Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it for you to do such a thing to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous and the wicked, listen, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you shall not the judge of all the earth deal Justly. Of course, if you read the rest of the passage, he gets down to just a handful of people. And of course, the reality is there's one righteous person in all of Sodom and Gomorrah, and God's not going to treat him like he treats the wicked. He's going to treat him as he treats the righteous, right? He's still going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but not lie. So the point I want you to notice here, if you open up any commentary, anyone I've ever opened up on Genesis 18, has come to this passage and talked about how Abraham bartered with God as if they were swapping a horse. And, and God had the horse, and Abraham's trying to get the horse for the lowest possible price. And so he continually starts with the, the, the cheapest price to him, and he, he gradually, that's not what's going on here. This isn't bartering. This isn't bargaining. This is Abraham doing something. By the way, something you and I need to do as well. He's trying to understand the nature of the God that he deals with. God, I have understood you so far to be a just God that you treat the righteous as righteous and you treat the wicked as wicked and you do that based upon the merits of the individual and you don't treat us all the same in, in that regard, although we all have equal opportunity to be righteous and to be wicked. Is that really who you are? That's the question that Abraham's asking, isn't it? Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justice? As we've already mentioned, the answer to that is yes, and we see that with the way that he treats Lot. He doesn't destroy Lot as he destroys the wicked in Sodom and Gomorrah, even though he lived amongst them. 
He redeemed Lot, didn't he? He saved Lot from that faith. Why? Well, we find out in the book of Hebrews, Lot, Lot was a righteous man. There's no reason to treat him as he was treating the unrighteous. The law of Moses is based on this same premise. Deuteronomy chapter 16, and there in verse 18, so circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. So the rich have no hand up with God, and, and the, the mighty have no hand up with God. Instead, verse 18, he executes justice for the orphan and the widow. In other words, those that society would neglect, those that society would say have no real standing, they have the same standing before God as the kings of this earth, as the wealthy in the world. God's law is the same for all of us. He even shows his love for the alien, the non-Israelite, by giving him food and clothing. Deuteronomy 16, verse 18 through 20. Notice what he says here. You shall appoint for yourself judges and officers in all the towns which the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial. You shall not take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall pursue that you may live and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Now, did that always happen in Israel? No. But that had nothing to do with God's design. It had nothing to do with God's equity. It had nothing to do with God's sense of justice or demand for justice. It had to do with man's sinful. Man perverting his purpose. Man perverting the image in which God had made him and called on him to bear. Amos chapter 9. We've got to get those prophets in. All the sinners of my people will die by the sword. That's kind of interesting. Because if it had just said all the sinners will die by the sword, I think most of us would say, oh, yeah, that sounds about right. Of my people. The special people that he, he chose, not to save differently, that's the point, but through which to bring the Messiah, this particular family that he raised up, guess what? He's going to treat them the same way in regard to sin as he's going to treat any and everyone else. Everybody here is part of a family. Is it hard to treat your family the way you treat everybody else? I know sometimes we can be a little meaner to our family than we are to everybody else. But when it, when it comes down for, for something difficult, when it comes down to really condemning an action, calling out sin, it's a little harder, isn't it? When son or daughter, mom or dad, brother or sister, it's a little easier in that moment, isn't it, for us to kind of Forget these ideas of justice and holiness and equity. Not God. Not God. All the sinners of my people. God is no respecter of persons. And the same principle in Testament. This isn't just an Old Testament concept. The passages like Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So there's the principle, there's, there's the means of entrance. If I don't have faith in all that that means, then I'm not in Christ Jesus and I'm not a son of God. Verse 27, for all of you were baptized, who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself into Christ. So if I haven't baptized, been baptized into Christ, I'm not the son of God. Who does that apply to? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you were all born in Christ Jesus. But Paul's not denying the reality that men are... are separated, the men have, have developed this idea of race. Paul's not denying there's a class structure, there's rich and there's poor. He's not denying that there's masters and slaves. He's not denying that there's men and women. Those, those are physical realities in this world, right? Paul's not saying do away with all that. No, he has a very different idea. In regards to salvation, justification, God sees us the same. In regards to our Method of service, we may see it differently, right? It's pretty clear to me in the New Testament there's different roles for men and women in the New Testament church. That's not what he has under consideration in Galatians chapter 2. He has in consideration the salvation of our soul. And from that basis, he looks at every one of us, regardless of where we're from, who we are, and sees us the same. Sinners in need of redemption, sinners in need of a sacrifice 
through which they could be forgiven of their sin. And there's simply no other sacrifice that could accomplish for us with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting to me if you read theology books that deal with the sacrifice of Jesus and, and how and what Jesus accomplished. There's a lot of different concepts or theories about that. Um, and, and I won't try to get into all of them, but there's, there's just a lot. There's, there's this idea of penal justice. There's, there's this idea that, that he just kind of took our place. In other words, he suffered for our sins as, as a sinner. I um, struggle with that one a lot. To me, the one that, that's the easiest to grasp, and, and maybe, maybe the one in which everything else is kind of wrapped up, is this idea that Jesus died to be the ransom. And, and that's kind of an interesting idea. It's, it's an idea from 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's, let's turn over there, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And, and I want you to notice how Paul talks about this. 1 Timothy chapter 2, and there beginning in verse 3. We find this out very clearly. Um, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. You know, if you go over to Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, find out that with his blood he purchased the church. It's the same idea. It's that idea of ransom. As a matter of fact, if you look that word up, it is the price for redeeming. In other words, if you were going to free a slave, you would take a ransom price and you would pay to free that slave. Ransom language is first found in our Bibles in the book of Exodus, and it has to do with taking the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt. And the ransom price that was paid, which ultimately was the lives of the firstborn, in all of Egypt. That was the price paid to relieve uh, Israel of their suffering and, and to take them out and to, to free them. You know, it's kind of interesting to me that after the children of Israel were freed, God comes to them and says, now you've got to ransom your first nation. He says, all the firstborn belong to me. As a matter of fact, there's a couple of passages you could go to to look at this. Um, Exodus 21, 30, Numbers 35, Exodus 13, 15, Numbers 18. Numbers 18 is kind of interesting to me because it lays out the price for your first one. And it's an interesting price. And I don't know what your morning was like with your kids, so some of you may think this is too expensive this morning, but I think in a, in a normal setting, a normal setting, you'll say, wow, that, that, that's not fair exchange. As a matter of fact, in Numbers 18, verses 15 through 16, you find out that a child could be redeemed for five shekels of silver. That's about $14. Yeah. Now again, I, I don't know what getting dressed for church was like this morning. Any other day of the week, if someone said, I'll take your child for $14, how many of us parents that love our kids would stop that nurse? My God. This gets me wondering why would God make that make that the ransom price for the first man? Why make it so cheap? Have you ever done that for somebody? Maybe there's something they really need. And, and they've worked hard to get. And it's kind of one of those situations where just giving them the thing would actually demean them. And, and so you, you've got the thing that they need, and, and they're trying to buy it from you. And you know, they, they don't have anywhere near the money that, that it would take. And so you say, how much you got? I'll take it. Why? Because you know they couldn't possibly pay the actual price. And so you take it and I think that may be the very idea here at making this price just so low, $14 for your firstborn son. If that wasn't God's way of saying, you couldn't even dream of paying the price. As a matter of fact, if you go over to Psalm 49, 
verses 7 through 8, and then again in verse 15. That's the very idea that the psalmist expresses. No man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of his soul is costly, and he should cease trying forever. But God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. The power of that statement. You couldn't redeem your brother, your child, your friend, yourself. You as a man, as, as a person, as a human being, we as people, we cannot by our own action, by our own power, redeem ourselves from one. And I think that's the point there in the second part of verse 8, he should cease trying forever. It's the idea that you would never be done trying. That, that it wouldn't matter how long you lived, it wouldn't matter you know, how rich you became or, or, or whatever it is that we're trying to trade, it, it would not matter what you're trying to accumulate to accomplish this, you simply cannot meet the price. Which may be the most depressing news we could ever hear if it weren't for the gospel. If it weren't for Jesus coming and living among us and living as us and doing what he does and what's described in Isaiah 53, as he's, he's gone to the slaughter silently like a lamb, Verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge of the, right, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great and he will drive out the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered to be with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. And we've talked about Isaiah 53. The idea of bearing sins there is not the idea of becoming guilty. But it's more that idea of the scapegoat carrying away the guilt of the people. He took away that which we could not bear. He did that which we could not do. And he and he alone could possibly have done it. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. You know, if you went back into chapter 9, you see this conversation about the tabernacle and about the Day of Atonement and the sacrifices that were made there. And what you find out is that all of that is perfectly embodied in Christ Jesus. That He did not take the blood of bulls and goats and offer that, but verse 12 says, through His own blood, He entered the holy place once and for all, listen, having obtained eternal redemption. That's our idea of ransom, isn't it? Having paid the price to release us from the guilt of sin, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling uh, those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much the Spirit offered Himself without blemish. And boy, that's such an important part of this. Offered Himself without blemish to God. Cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. And drop down to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Therefore, when He comes into the world, into the world He says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired. But a body you have prepared for me, sacrifice and offering you have not desired. We've talked about that many times. It's not that God didn't command the sacrifices and the offerings. It's that God wanted the righteousness. And we failed to provide and thus needed the sacrifice and the offering. What he wanted from us was love demonstrated through obedience. What he got from us was rebellion demonstrated through sin. But then Jesus came. And what Jesus does is something that no one else could do. And I want you to notice this, because there's a difference in Jesus and the innocent young child, or the one who is, is never capable of being accountable. Think with that, with that baby, there's pure innocence, isn't it? But that's not what this is calling for. This is calling for perfect obedience. And, and so that innocent babe, or that one who's never able to be mature to the point of accountability, they, they're not capable of this. No, Jesus and Jesus alone is able to provide what is needed. He says, a body you have prepared for me. And the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, here's the problem. 
Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Who is that sacrifice without blemish in chapter 9? What blemish are we talking about? We're talking about the blemish of sin. Another reason that Jesus could not have become guilty for our sins when he went to the cross, he would have been blemished. Because of his righteousness, because of his obedience, because of his perfect service to the Father, he stood as the one unblemished sacrifice. Verse 8, after these things, above, after saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. He said, behold, I have come, listen, to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Once and for all. Why did Jesus die? Why did the Christ have to go to the cross? Well, because he was little. And like all those other sacrifices throughout, he was little. Because it was the perfectly obedient sacrifice. He was without being. Not in a representative way of the Old Testament. Remember under the old law, the sacrifice couldn't be lame and it couldn't be blind and it couldn't have a bruise. And so you would have to take that sacrifice out of the field and put it in the stall and protect it for a time so, so that it would be as perfect as the sacrifice could be. That's not the idea with Jesus. As a matter of fact, by the time he gets to the cross, he's, he's about as bruised as you can get. But in regards to righteousness and sin, he's completely different. Something no one else has done. Because of that, he is the final sacrifice. You and I, we don't need the blood of bulls and goats. We have the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus which accomplished for us that which nothing else could possibly hope to accomplish. Accomplished for us our salvation. Why did Jesus have to die? Well, because we sin. Because God is no respect of person. Because he alone could be the perfect sacrifice. If you're sitting here right now and there's sin in your life, I hope you're thinking. What Jesus gave up, what he alone could do, so that we could be forgiven. If you're not a child of God, I hope this will fit your heart. I hope it will lead you to repentance. So confess the name of Jesus that we can baptize you in the waters of baptism. You can rise to walk in newness of life. You can Maybe you're, you've become a Christian. And yet you've strayed from your path and you've marred your image and you need God's help to be restored. That same Jesus died to forgive your sins. So I hope you'll take that seriously. I hope that you'll repent and to beg his forgiveness. If we can help you with these things in any way, why don't you let us know right now while we're